Okay, we will reconvene at 20 minutes of 12. We're going to do a few uh, impacted live entertainment venues, and then we'll take a lunch break, and we will pass the baton to Jill Griffin. Chairman Crosby, commissioners, um, we have received petitions from five venues to be designated as impacted uh, live entertainment venues. One of these petitions from uh, the Mass Performing Arts Coalition on behalf of the Hanover Theater in Worcester has been withdrawn from um, consideration. Great. In, in light of the recent live entertainment cooperation agreement um, that they've negotiated with MGM. So the Hanover Theater no longer wishes to be designated as an impacted live entertainment venue by the commission. So relative to the MGM application, um, we have the Eastern States Exposition in West Springfield and the Majestic Theater in West Springfield. Um, and here today, I have um, members of the Majestic Theater. Um, I have um, the president, Danny Eaton, and um, Todd Cadis, the treasurer. Um, so they're going to speak to the following conditions that are in the statute um, that the commission will consider. Um, the definition, a not-for-profit or mun municipally owned performance venue designated in whole or in part for the presentation of live concerts, comedy, or theatrical performances, which the commission determines experiences or is likely to experience a negative impact from the development or operation of a gaming establishment. Um, additionally, the commission can consider the venue's distance from the gaming establishment, the venue capacity, and the type of performances that will be offered um, by that venue. Uh, the commission can also consider whether the applicant intends to include a geographic e exclusivity clause in the contracts of entertainments at the proposed gaming establishment, or in some other way intends to limit the performance of the entertainment uh, entertainers within Massachusetts. So I'm gonna turn um, the presentation over um, to the Majestic Theater. And followed uh, by the Majestic Theater, we have folks from um, the Eastern States Exposition, um, John Giuliano, Eugene Cassidy, and Mark press. Um, so I'm going to turn it right over to you. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Good morning. I'm uh, Danny Eaton, the founder and producing director for the Majestic Theater. And I'm Todd Cadis, the treasurer, and I do the marketing at the theater. A uh, couple of uh, thank yous before we start. Uh, I think the first thing I want to thank and acknowledge is whoever it was that had the foresight to include the uh, ILEV in the uh, CMR. Uh, we very much appreciate that. That's our protection. And I also want to thank Mayor Ed Sullivan, who uh, two days after he was inaugurated, called us into his office and, and pointed out that ILEV section in the CMR, which we were completely unaware of, and uh, told us that uh, we should get an application in. I think that was on January 8th, and the deadline was the 13th. Now, <clears throat> audiences uh, are the ones who make the decision who will be impacted. So we thought, what better way than to uh, talk to our audience? So at some recent performances, I got up on the stage in front of the audience, and I asked them two questions. The first question was, in the past year, how many of you have gone to a performance at City Stage? And I want to clarify, I'm talking about City Stage, not Symphony Hall, the 400-seat theater inside the parking garage in Springfield. So show of hands, please. And 10.3% of the audience raised their hands saying yes, they had been to a performance at City Stage within the past year. That brought me to uh, question number two, when I said, if at City Stage there was a production like Educating Rita, that's our current production, and the ticket prices were comparable, 
at, to their ticket prices here at the Majestic, and the parking was free, all things being similar, would you go to a production like Educating Rita at City Stage? Again, show of hands, please. And 37.7% of the audience raised their hand saying yes, they would go to City Stage. Well, I think you have some uh, packets that we prepared in front of you. I want to call your attention to the second page. It's an article from the Springfield Republican on uh, January 24th of this year. The title of the uh, article is MGM Casino Makes Its Case. I'm so sorry, Chairman. I don't mean to interrupt. I don't think we've seen the package. Oh. Do you have any others? I'm sorry? No, wait, here's uh, Jill's going to bring one over. Okay, thanks. All right, a couple of paragraphs in, in that article on, on the second page that I've highlighted. Central to the company's plan for the city is its entertainment pitch. Murren, now we're talking about Jim Murren, who is the CEO of MGM. Murren noted that under a marketing arrangement cemented in the host community agreement, MGM will underwrite, co-promote, and book at least four shows each at the Mass Mutual Center, Symphony Hall, and City Stage each year following the opening of the casino. Quote, our venues are Springfield's venues. We have guaranteed 12 shows annually, unquote. Murren said, I can assure you that marketing agreement towards, goes toward promoting the other great events that take place here. That's Jim Murren, the CEO of MGM. Now I want to go back to our audience survey. So on page three here, you can see that the Majestic Theater's annual revenues for the last four years are presented as far as the ticket admissions to the theater. And the point we wanted to make here was that if, for example, half of those people who we surveyed that said they would go to city stage, half of that 37.7% actually went to City Stage, that using the fiscal year 2013 ticket admissions <coughs> revenues of about $834,000, that impact to the Majestic Theater, if only half of those people went, would be about $156,000 annually. You're assuming if, if they went and didn't go to your theater? We specifically Instead. asked the question number two so that we did not steer them in either direction. No, but in terms of your lost, re you're talking about lost revenue. If, the, if those folks went to City Stage, it would be lost revenue to Majestic. Correct. That's correct. That's assuming that the trip to City Stage wasn't an additional trip. That was instead of going to Majestic. That's correct. Right. right. Okay. Now, in truth, the, we don't, at the Majestic, we don't know what the extent of, of the financial impact will be. We don't have a crystal ball. But we're certain from, because our audience has told us so, that there will be an impact. Now, oh, wait. we... Uh, can, I, can I come back to the question that yes, Chairman sir. Crosby just asked a minute ago? Uh, you, you make that statement based on the 37% response. Correct. And you're taking the 37% response as an instead of response, instead of an additive response. No. Right. No. What we're saying is that 37% of the people said if there was a production comparable to the quality of the production right. educating read at the Majestic Theater, right. would you go to City State? So 10% right. of them said they've already been in the past year. 37.7% right. said they would go if there was a comparable production. Now, we, we did not ask, as you asked, was it an either or? Would you go here and not there? We, we, as we said, we don't, how do we determine what the impact is? We don't know the extent of the impact. We know that the audience has said they would go. Well, 10% had been both to City Stage and you by definition. Correct. 27% had been only to you, right? Well, that 37% included the 10%. Included the Assuming. Yeah. 
And 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 so you're you're assuming that 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 twenty percent wouldn't be adding another show to their to their um, uh, entertainment uh, uh, to their play going. We're not ma making any assumption. Uh, we're simply saying that our audience has has indicated to us that there will be an impact. We don't know what that impact is. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Um, you know, for um, 18 years since the Majestic has been in existence, we have uh, competed w with uh, City Stage. You know, the audience in the Pioneer Valley in Western Massachusetts, it's a finite uh, number. And you can see in the next three pages. Um, uh, actually, can I, can I ask I'm a sorry. question about these two questions? Yes. One looks back a year and the other one is prospective. Correct? I'm sorry, I don't follow you? The, the first question you ask in your survey looks back at your behavior in the last year. Yes. The second question asks about a prospective behavior. Would you go in the future? Correct. Would, it, would there be a parallel, um, if I were, to, could, could the difference account for the intention and the reality? In other words, if, if somebody asked me, how many times have you been to the gym? Last year, I, I could have a number uh, that I could tell you how, exactly how many times I did. Uh, but if you ask me about my intention on going to the gym next year, that, sure. that difference could be significant. Yes, it could. Especially going to the gym. Yeah. <laughs> and it may not come true. And the point, the, the, the the point the being is that my right? intention, <laughs> that the difference could account, could account, is it not the case, for the difference between the intention in the future and the reality of the past? Is that a fair statement? I guess it would have to be, okay. sure. Yeah. I mean, we don't, we, again, we don't know. We don't have, we don't have that crystal ball. Thank you. I, I started this by beating up on the methodology, and I don't think that's really the point here. This is imperfect research at best. Oh, all, yes, you're, sir. all you're trying to do is put on the table that there might very well be an impact, and I think that's a reasonable proposition. What that is, is anybody's guess. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, all right, so continuing on, um, you know, as I started to say, you know, we've uh, competed with, with City Stage before. With City Stage, it was Stage West uh, for the 18 years of, uh, of our existence at the Majestic. Uh, these next pages, you can see some side-by-side -side ads. Majestic Theater, uh, City Stage. Um, next page, uh, Majestic Theater, City Stage, and even the Bushnell. Uh, the third page in there, uh, Majestic Theater, and actually MGM's show, uh, Boys to Men, the, the show that they sponsored recently. So we, again, the, the point is we compete for the audience in, in uh, Western Massachusetts. And there are, there are a lot of marketing things that uh, MGM could do to get an audience to city stage that we cannot do at the Majestic Theater. And for instance, they could offer free parking and a, and a trolley ride, as they said they were going to do the city stage. They could offer $10 off dinner if they showed their ticket stub after the show. They could offer free tickets. They could offer uh, somebody to pay uh, with their MGM bonus dollars for their tickets. Hey, stop giving them ideas, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> The, the point is, again, we, we compete. You know, the next uh, two pages in our little packet, you know, is an article in the Springfield paper that talks about a, a show of ours at the Majestic. Uh, the following page is, again, two articles in the Springfield paper. It talks about a show at Symphony Hall and a show at uh, City Stage. So for 18 years, we've competed. And we've competed uh, uh, fairly and, and I think um, successfully. If you see this following page from Mass Live, the Republican, uh, down at the bottom, the best live theater company, Majestic Theater in West Springfield. From the Valley Advocate, which is our uh, weekly arts and entertainment newspaper in, in the Pioneer Valley, uh, the Majestic Theater. Best, live, best place to see live theater. Uh, third place, city stage. Uh, the next page is uh, one of the requirements of the ILV 
was to show proximity. So we actually went to Google Maps and printed out a map to show you how close we are between the two venues, the Majestic Theater and City Stage. And the uh, last uh, document is a letter of support from uh, Mayor Ed Sullivan, our mayor in, in West Springfield, uh, supporting our petition for ILEV status. So despite all of the advertising and the uh, press releases and the marketing that we do out in Western Mass, um, in the last year and a half that MGM Springfield has been out in Western Mass, no one has contacted us. Uh, there have been two Six Flags. They've talked to this theater in Worcester, but nobody's made contact with us. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we never heard uh, from anyone at MGM until we filed the petition for uh, ILEV. And the first real conversation we had with anyone was two days ago, Sunday afternoon, with a, an attorney for MGM. And the, the gist of our conversation was, uh, he kept asking us, what do we want? What do we want? And, and we had no answers at that point. Um, I can tell you that we've had a two hour truck ride through traffic from Western Mass to think about it. And we have a couple of ideas that we'd like to suggest. Well, you know, we do want MGM to succeed. I mean, Todd and I both live there. Our kids live there and grown up there. So we certainly want MGM to uh, succeed. We just don't want them to succeed at uh, our expense. And our audience has told us that there will be an impact. Thank you. Thank well, you. Sir, how, how many seats are at the Majestic Theater? How many seats? Yes. Uh, we see 229. Subscribable seats. We can actually accommodate a few more than that. But what what is the organization that we met with? Was it you and I that met with them? That, yes, the, the mass. Uh, yeah, the mass performing arts uh, coalition? coalition. Yeah. Are you you're apparently not a part of that coalition? We are not. Just for future reference, it might be useful because they've been they've been very very involved in this and been talking to us about this for two years. They are responsible in part for the legislation you're talking about. Yeah, but yes. That would be a worthwhile organization to be a part of. I, 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 I think you're right. I mean, it, but it's also interesting that we're kind of unfamiliar with with them. Yeah, I, I can't, yeah. I, I can't explain that. But anyway. Yes. Okay, MGM. Uh, thanks, uh, Chairman. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our reading of the regulations, a little bit about the background of MGM's overall approach to venues in the vicinity, because I think that's relevant. Um, talk a little bit uh, about um, the Commission's evaluation of this particular uh, proposal. And I'm uh, uh, also introduce uh, Kelly Tucky to talk a little bit about um, our thoughts uh, about the Majestic, really outside of the ILEV process, which we think is uh, not appropriate uh, designation for uh, a theater of this type. And we don't think that it's uh, met. Uh, certainly the requirements under the statutes. And really the statute and regulations here uh, attempt to address um, the potential for gaming applicants to car cause harm to existing venues. I think that's been articulated um, uh, here today. And you know, first and foremost, and going back to your discussions back in, in, uh, in I think the fall of 2012, I mean the biggest protection that the statute provides is really the prohibition of any venue building um, ticketed uh, um, uh, venue in between uh, the number of seats, I think between 1,000 and 3,500. Uh, really an intent by the legislature to ensure that um, the uh, applicants coming to Massachusetts were going to displace uh, those type and that size of facilities. Second, the statute and regulations are designed to protect existing venues from potential advantages that gaming applicants may have in attracting talent to venues uh, that are part of the casino development. I think the commission discussed extensively back again in the fall of 2012 uh, around these supply side uh, concerns and really modeled and developed its regulations, I think, uh, off of um, that. And specifically, the best example there is the, um, the really the acknowledgement of the regulations and I think a uh, clear signal to all the applicants of you know, being very careful about things like radius restrictions. <clears throat> 
the statutes and regulations aren't designed to protect every venue from competition in the market. They're designed to protect <laughs> from the use or abuse of market power through the potential subsidized entertainment office, offers put in place, uh, such as radius restrictions and other anti-competitive practices that may limit performances in Massachusetts. Um, <clears throat> Going to MGM's overall approach that we've taken uh, when it comes to uh, utilizing venues, we haven't proposed to build a, a venue on site as part of the development. Um, we plan to utilize existing venues that have been highlighted here um, within the city of Springfield, including City Stage, Symphony Hall, and the Mass Mutual Center. We've ex executed agreements with other venues for cross-marketing and promotion, um, most notably, I think mentioned today, the agreement with the MPAC, uh, Tanglewood, and other attractions. And we've really gone out of our way, I think, to uh, attempt to utilize the uh, resources that uh, we think uh, make sense and potentially uh, some of the ones certainly in the city of Springfield that have the potential to be uh, impacted as uh, contemplated by the regulations. So we're looking at issues here of distance. We've pointed out it's 2.3 miles away. Um, it appears to be uh, certainly in proximity, the, uh, the Majestic's theater. Um, we look at venue uh, capacity. We look at the type of performances. And then the commission has to go back and determine um, really uh, whether the venue is going to experience is likely to experience uh, some sort of uh, negative impact. Um, <clears throat> Really, the thrust, I think, of the Majestic's presentation uh, here today is that they have um, an existing competitive relationship with City Stage, um, and that that competitive relationship may change due to the fact that MGM has agreed to promote uh, two events or three events there uh, per year. Um, and again, we're competing with the same number of customers and essentially the same number of dollars. In a lot of ways, it's a little bit like the arguments that we heard today around Northampton. There's only a finite amount of, uh, of entertainment do dollars available, and if we were to add anything to this particular region, then it's essentially a zero-sum game. So it's an overall premise that we reject based on our overall marketing, our ability to certainly grow this market and present different uh, offerings when it comes to uh, entertainment, uh, including through uh, uh, City Stage. And really, I think you have to do you know, look at the capacity here uh, as an issue, um, and the majestic approximately 240 seats. You know, it's it is smaller certainly from uh, City Stage, um, and I think the differences between City Stage and the majestic are also really um, uh, uh, I think demonstrated. And when you talk about the type of performances, and really, what, what is the size of City Stage? City Stage is approximately. Uh, 400. 400, yeah. Maybe a little bit over And you're 260, yeah. 70? Yeah. 230. 30. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so really, you know, the, the Majestic is a, is a wonderful theater that has a strong subscription-based um, uh, 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 group of, uh, of patrons. Um, they, uh, uh, in their, uh, in their uh, petition, they've indicated they do uh, 100 shows per year. They focus on local talent. They include musicals, dramas, comedies. We've used sort of, I think, the current uh, production there, Educating Rita, as a, sort of a, a reference point, certainly when the uh, survey uh, was done there. Um, it's really very different from the type of entertainment that I would suggest is currently offered at uh, City Stage, which includes mostly traveling uh, acts and uh, performers that, performance that are from uh, outside of the state. And again, um, in looking at the petition and what I think the, the regulations were designed here to protect, is are we taking anything away from the supply that, um, that and when it comes to generating their performances that the Majestic currently has? And we're just not contemplating putting on or sponsoring our, the events that we are at City Stage, uh, such as a play like Educating Rita. It's really, from our perspective, very much apples and oranges. And again, um, uh, we think that it's uh, something that's uh, you know, easily uh, distinguishable. Um, we're not going to sponsor similar plays. We're not going to take from their talent pool. We're not going to impact their ability in order to produce their product that they can then go out and compete in the marketplace uh, for, uh, for subscribers. <clears throat> 
So with that said, we really, uh, you know, certainly recognize the Majestic as an important part of the community in West Springfield. Um, and I want to do provide an opportunity to, for Kelly Tucky to tell a little bit about how we've been thinking about the, uh, the Majestic um, and really where I think the additive nature of what MGM is bringing to this region can benefit institutions like the Majestic. Um, including but not limited to the fact that we're bringing 3,000 new employees to the area, potential patrons. Um, and really this has been, um, you know, largely, I think, uh, ignored by the Majestic that there potentially might be some benefits here that might come with the fact that we're coming and making a major investment in this area. So with that, I'll before you Before on. you leave that, could you just yeah. expand on the, on the differentiation between the type of entertainment that's at the Majest uh, Majestic and, and, the, and the city stage? It, seems to me um, you've made one distinction that the Majestic uses essentially local talent while the city stage uses traveling uh, uh, performers, of, uh, traveling companies perhaps. But the, but the nature of the performance, the content of the performance, they, I mean they both do dramas, they both do comedies, they both do um, uh, a repertoire that's been on Broadway. Um, uh, how, what, what's the other I'm differentiation? Gonna, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Mathis to address this a little bit because he can talk a little bit more about the MVM entertainment um, uh, options. And I do think it's important, though, uh, Commissioner, that we talk about that really in the context of what we're doing with City Stage, what MGM is doing with City Stage, not necessarily just in the generic sense of uh, everything that City Stage and, um, and uh, uh, has to, okay, has to fair otherwise point. offer. So thanks. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Mr. Commissioner, I think I think it's an important question in terms of um, is is our programming uh, competitive? And um, I, one of the comments that was made uh, was a reference to the quote by uh, our chairman um, Jim Murren about the number of shows right. that we intend to put into those facilities. Um, no, I don't want to. I don't want to overcommit, um, especially because I think I'll have to live with it based on the, the announcement will. the other day. Um, <laughs> But I can tell you that uh, it is not our intent to be competitive. Uh, it, the host community agreement, for example, I was looking if I could find the reference, but my recollection based on that negotiation was there was a specific reference to uh, the type of programming that we were required to put into uh, both Mass Mutual Center, Symphony Hall, City Stage. That was part of our, uh, our uh, cross-marketing MOU agreement with Jim Rooney. So it wasn't just enough to say that we would put acts in there, but we would put acts of a national, regional nature. So, um, and, I, and it's unfortunate that we're having this conversation with the Majestic in this context, because I think uh, had we had the opportunity both ways, they could have contacted us, certainly, and we could have contacted them, we'd be able to lay a lot of these concerns. But to, to answer your question um, on point is, we intend to attract local, uh, sorry, regional and national talent to those venues, uh, that's uh, a local um, uh, perf uh, a local performers wouldn't meet that criteria, um, and I don't think it would be true to the spirit of the commitment we made to, to Jim Rooney, which was to put in uh, the type of acts that would draw from outside the market. And I think you know one of the questions um, that I would have for the Majestic, and I think I I think I understand their market is what is how, how many of their customers come from outside of the market? How much of it is local? How much of it is uh, destination traffic? We plan to make our, uh, our, our, our uh, acts destinations to draw from outside the market. And I think that's an important dis distinction. Um, the other important distinction, I think, is the, the number of shows. We've made a minimum commitment, which is a, you know, it's, it's fair to, to say it's a minimum uh, of three to four shows um, for each of those venues. For example, we haven't programmed City Stage yet. We've, we've done a mass mutual show uh, of, with Pitbull and um, professional bull riding, and we've also had a Boys to Men show in Symphony Hall. And the reason that we haven't programmed City Stage is because it's a difficult venue to program. So um, if that's helpful for our intent, that we'll meet the minimum, but I think you know, we're hoping City Stage can uh, program it on its own after we meet our minimum. We don't have an intent to match 100 shows, for example. I think the number of shows that would be in conflict is three or four percent, three or four out of the hundred that they program. Uh, so if if, um, if that's helpful, we can we can give you some more of a sense of the programming. But uh, we would we would look to coordinate calendars. We can make any of this part of the record if that's helpful. We don't intend to uh, restrict any of our talent from performing at their uh, majestic theater. Again, we'd be happy to put that on the record. 
Um, we haven't reached out to them because we don't view them as competitive. We view them as complementary, and that's a conversation we intended to have farther down the road. Um, it's a venue that I think we would we would encourage and promote to our uh, to our employees because I think it's a local venue, and again, I think we'll 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 help them, not hurt them. All things that we can discuss outside of the context of this hearing, but we certainly don't believe we'll be competitive. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and, and commissioners. Uh, the topic of employee benefits and employee programming is something near and dear to my heart, and I'm, I'm anxious to, to tell you what we have in mind for an institution such as Majestic Theater, and, and I think it's fair to call it a cultural institution. Um, we are in the practice of, of promoting local venues and, and local uh, vendor services and providers to our employees through a really unique marketing opportunity that we created in Las Vegas and then brought to our regional properties and we would do the same with Springfield and that is the M Life Insider program and such as the name implies insiders get the the first shot the inside scoop the inside track on opportunities um, before um, anyone else so through M Life Insider, we have a very robust uh, portal where we place offers and benefits and discount programs and make um, opportunities such as tickets to Majestic Theater available to our employees. So Insider partners such as Majestic Theater are permitted to advertise to our employees through this 24-7 portal. And uh, just to touch upon what was mentioned briefly, um, and we haven't spent a lot of time on, I think it's important to note that once you provide 3,000 jobs and you provide people with additional discretionary income and you make the, the opportunity to go to Majestic Theater and other venues available to employees, that's part of the economic development, the economic outreach that I think the Commission is looking for and that the legislation provided for. So we would be uh, more than happy to talk to Majestic Theater about such an opportunity at MGM Springfield and, and reaching out to our employees as a target audience for them. Thank you. Okay. I have a question. Um, is the plan uh, for the support of these acts to have those acts be ticketed um, events? Mr. Mattis? Mattis? Yeah. Yes, Commissioner Zuniga, the, the cross-marketing agreements we have for those three venues, is that what you're referencing? Yes. Absolutely. Um, they will be ticketed venues because I think one of the other areas of distinction, again, I don't want to overcommit, is that we're going to pay heavily for, for the type of acts that we're trying to bring. Um, <clears throat> Pitbull was an expensive show. PBR is an expensive show. Boys to Men as well. And because of that, if you look at the ticket prices, as I understand it, I don't want to misstate the record, but having looked at the Majestic, I think it's a $20 type ticket. They do subscriptions, and I think the subscription issue is an important point. It's a different model. It's a local, locals performing for local customers. They buy five ticket packages. Um, we're we're going to do one offs, and we're going to promote it to an ad, mostly an adult entertainment um, customer. So they will be ticketed, but there'll, there'll also be some aspect of it that will be um, you know, comps for valued customers, examples like that. Sure. But I think of them as outside customers. I don't think of it as primarily feeding the local market, which I think is what Majestic does, and I'm looking forward to be a, being a customer of theirs. Uh, I had one question as well. When you talk about your commitment with your host community, um, three possibly four shows. You're talking about one night shows, not long runs of whatever acts. Is that correct? Th that's correct. Our, our minimum commitment is would be to an, in, an evening. Um, we may potentially do two days, but from our perspective, these shows are loss leaders. We, we would be subsidizing these shows at a loss because of, one, our commitment to the city, and two, to create, um, to create um, a draw for our customers that will spend money in other parts of the resort. So believe me when I tell you, um, our intent is not to overly program these venues. We're hoping that we give them a boost and that they're able to then continue successfully on their own. Anybody else? Um, Okay, thank you. It does seem to me like it might make sense how, why, as you say, it didn't matter really why, why there weren't conversations previously, but it does sound like even as we're going ahead and looking into this, like it might make sense for you all to talk now, and, and as has frequently happened, maybe this can be resolved without us having to go all the way in our decision. At least it's worth a shot. We're happy to do that. We'll try to do that. 
Okay. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Appreciate your driving all the way in town. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and I believe we now have Eastern States Exposition. Ready? You didn't need more of a break. Gentlemen, introduce yourselves and the floor is yours. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, my name is Mark Kress. I'm a lawyer with Bulkley Richardson in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, seated to my right is uh, Gene Cassidy. He's the uh, president and CEO of Eastern States Exposition. And to my left is uh, John Giuliano who is the Director of Special Events and Entertainment at the Eastern States Exposition. Uh, I, I think the, uh, the issue before the, the Commission uh, this morning is a very, very uh, simple one. Um, our reading, or the Eastern States Exposition uh, reading of the statute and regulations, is, is that there is a fir an affirmative duty on uh, any applicant for a gaming license in the Commonwealth to reach out to um, not only surrounding communities but impact at live entertainment venue uh, sites and negotiate a good faith agreement. Uh, that has not happened in this case. Not only has the, the uh, uh, reach out not occurred in any significant sense, but we are also faced like the Majestic uh, with being inconvenienced uh, and financially burdened by having to appear before the Commission to defend a position which uh, should be quite obvious. Um, we, we submitted a response to the MGM opposition which details um, the, the, the overwhelming uh, reasons why uh, the Eastern States Exposition should be uh, designated a, uh, a protected venue and we would urge the Commission to um, carefully review those papers. But ra rather than dwell on that um, at, at this point, we, we, we think the Eastern States couldn't fit more precisely within those statutory and regulatory uh, deficit definitions. But rather than dwell on that, which is uh, all, as I said, uh, detailed in writing in the uh, formal response we've submitted, I'd like to uh, allow Gene Cassidy the, uh, the President and CEO of the Eastern States to personally tell you a little bit about the exposition and why it is deserving of the protections uh, specifically afforded under the gaming statute. Good afternoon, uh, commissioners uh, and, and ladies and gentlemen in attendance. Being mindful of the short window that we have, I hope you don't mind that I'm going to read from uh, prepared statements uh, to increase uh, efficiency. Uh, I am Gene Cassidy, and the President and the Chief Executive Officer of the Eastern States Exposition, and I'm here today uh, to personally tell you as much as I can in this short window about the Eastern States. I have uh, put a, a, a board up for you uh, to peruse, and for my friends at MGM who might not be able to see it, I'll offer Mr. Mathis a copy. We have a long history. We have one-of-a-kind, irreplaceable agricultural and educational programming that plays a critical role in the Western Massachusetts economy. My need to be here is to personally ask you to help protect it from one of the most daunting challenges we have ever faced, the development and operation of an $800 million casino in downtown Springfield, less than two miles from our location in West Springfield. Eastern States Exposition, commonly known by our agricultural affairs trade name, the Big E, has continuously operated for more than 97 years. Eastern States Exposition is the largest cultural event that occurs on the Eastern Seaboard, with year-round visitation that exceeds 2.5 million people. We are the fifth largest fair in all of North America, 
hosting nearly 1.5 million people at our agricultural event annually. Ranked by size, we fall behind only the Texas State Fair, the Houston Livestock Show, the San Antonio Livestock Show and Rodeo, and the Minnesota State Fair, all of whom receive taxpayer-funded subsidies for infrastructure and operations from their respective state governments. The Eastern States Exposition receives no such financial assistance. According to Regional Economic Models, Inc., an economic modeling firm that creates models for Fortune 100 companies, as well as worldwide governments and universities, a firm that is located here in Massachusetts. The Eastern States Exposition generates an economic impact on the greater Springfield re region that is nearly a half of a billion dollars. I'll repeat, nearly one half of a billion dollars. We create 3,000 jobs in Hamden County, $92 million in personal income in the county. Furthermore, Remy calculates that ESC generates $3 million in income tax revenues to the Commonwealth, $1.4 million in sales tax revenues to the Commonwealth, more than $430,000 in hotel taxes for the greater Springfield area, and over $3.3 million in food and beverage tax revenues. Additionally, the Eastern States Exposition impact reaches well beyond greater Springfield and accounts for an additional 2,000 jobs and $134 million in personal income throughout New England. Eastern States Exposition at nearly 100 years old has been overlooked by legislators and regulators for a long time. I implore you today to address the concerns we present, to ask questions of me, and ultimately to set the stage to prepare necessary protections for this quiet organization, and an organization that has provided unique and irreplaceable agricultural and educational programming and enormous horsepower to the greater Springfield economy since its founding by our visionary patriarch, Joshua Loring Brooks, and his contemporaries, including Horace Moses, James and Helen Storrow, J.C. Penney, and many others. More than just a fair, in addition to the portfolio of economic benefits of a healthy Eastern States Exposition, we have fulfilled a mission that supports agriculture, communities of New England, and beyond. We host future farmers of America and 4-H youth from across the country. Eastern States Exposition is the only fair in America that has FFA participation from as many as 18 states. We produce some of the most important and renowned equine, bovine, and swine shows in the country, including one of the oldest horse shows in America. This month, January 2014, we hosted the largest poultry show in the United States. Yeah. I'll start. Yeah. We host important trade shows, some of which are counted among the largest in the country. Among them, one of the largest machine tool manufacturing shows in North America. Certainly the largest east of the Mississippi takes place biennially at the eastern states. Other events, though less glamorous, number over 100, including summer country music festivals and performances of the symphony, Springfield Symphony Summer Pop Series. All of these events, though not specifically mentioned or protected by gaming legislation, are precariously balanced by the success of the fair. Without the fair and its ability to attract large crowds by offering an array of top quality live concerts and comedy performances, and other year-round scheduled events that provide the economic underpinning for our operation, the world of agriculture, agricultural best practices, and education, and the regional economy suffer. More than agriculture, Storton Village Museum, founded in 1929 by Mrs. Helen Storrow, was the first undertaking of its kind in the United States. The village of 18th century and early 19th century buildings was created at Eastern States Exposition when buildings from throughout New England were disassembled from their original locations and moved piece by piece, brick by brick, beam by <coughs> beam, to the grounds of Eastern States. Until that time, never before in American history had such efforts been made to preserve American history. While antique buildings had been preserved on their foundations, never had such important buildings been moved to be saved. Again, 
Although there is no specific mention in any gaming legislation that requires protections for su such civic assets, the exposition's ability to continue to offer and operate such valuable and one-of-a-kind assets will certainly be compromised without the protections afforded under the impacted live entertainment venues provisions in the gaming statute. Our history, beginning with the National Dairy Show in 1916, includes a prominent role in the development of the American Hockey League at our storied Coliseum, featuring some of the greatest names in American hockey, including Teddy Shore, the Springfield Indians, the Springfield Kings, and at one time the home to the New England, now Hartford Whalers. Most importantly, through it all and still, we have featured the biggest names in entertainment, annual visits from the greats of days gone by, like Bob Hope, Gene Autry, Johnny Cash, Buddy Hackett, Liberace, Sid Charisse, Arthur Godfrey, and Paul Lind, to contemporaries of today, like Beyonce, Jessica Simpson, Brad Paisley, Reba McIntyre, The Beach Boys, Fergie, Miranda Lambert, Def Leppard, Leonard Skinner, Austin Mahone, DJ Pauly, Alan Jackson, Hunter Hayes, Jeff Dunham, Carrie Underwood, and on and on and on, including summertime outdoor country music festivals that attract tens of thousands for just day-long events. In, in 2013 alone, we produced 93 live entertainment performances on large stages, 51 live entertainment performances on the Storton Village small stage, 51 circus performances, and 51 shows on the Avenue of States stage. I personally ask the commissioners to assist Eastern States Exposition in our effort not only to continue to offer top entertainment, live entertainment in Western Mass, but also to continue to be able to offer other unique and irreplaceable agriculture and educational program we produce by designating Eastern States Exposition as an impacted live entertainment venue. I am limited by respect for your time and the margins of my capacity as only the seventh president in our 100 year history to lead this august organization known as Eastern States Exposition. I hope I have done adequate justice to one of the most important and proven entertainment and economic development resources that exists for Greater Springfield, for Massachusetts, for New England, and for agriculture in the entire United States, the Eastern States Exposition. I hope I've gotten your attention, piqued your interest, and cultivated the process necessary to protect Eastern States from what is evidencing itself to be the most daunting challenge we've faced since our founding a century ago. That this proven name in entertainment and regional, regional economic development, that this 501c3 self-supporting, non-taxpayer supported public charity has regrettably been forced to appear before you today, its very existence challenged by an entertainment and financial behemoth accompanied by the phalanx of lawyers and advisors who can wax on romantic about their ties to New England, yet had no legitimate deal, dialogue with Eastern States Exposition that we are forced to appear today with our attorney, Bulkley Richardson and Julius, a firm that has represented us since Warren G. Harding was president. And as much as he loves the Big E, he doesn't come here for free. It Ooh. says something. Harding? <laughs> <laughs> it says something. It says something at minimum. It reveals that Eastern States Exposition needs your assistance and your intervention. Eastern States Exposition supports on a grand scale unique programming, as well as, and in an important way, the economy of the region, the state, New England, and beyond. We play a role that deserves, a role that requires special attention. The ability of Eastern States Exposition to continue to offer such programming and economic benefit will, without a doubt, sig be significantly threatened unless the Commission designates it an impacted live entertainment venue entitling it to the protections <coughs> afforded under the gaming statute. In closing, I want you to know that I am grateful for your time and I appreciate your thoughtful consideration and I encourage any questions you might have. Commissioners? Thank you. I don't know where the nexus of the competition is. I mean, they're not going to take the poultry show, I assume, but where where is the where is the competition that you're concerned about? Well, the uh, competition clearly is in our ability to seek and book uh, name entertainment. Um, the fact of the matter is Eastern States has had an incredibly difficult time uh, 
since the advent of the casinos just 75 miles away in Connecticut. They've driven the price of entertainment up to, uh, into the sky, skyrocketed into the hemisphere, or stratosphere, I should say. Um, they have blockouts on dates and uh, distances. So it's the big it's shows, it's, it's the, the Beyonce's. Shows. It's the big shows. And, and frankly, you know, and, and uh, frankly, I have great fear that, uh, you know, with the advent of their ability to, to manage and operate the, the, what I finally call the Springfield Civic Center, but the Mass Mutual Center, uh, they could take shows away from the Eastern States that presently uh, we have. And they're very important to our existence. You mean trade shows? Trade shows, and, mm -hmm. and, and yes, they could take the poultry show, too. <laughs> okay. When, Go ahead. When, when you book the shows that you were mentioning earlier, um, what's the capacity of audience? We have, uh, if you're not familiar with the Eastern States, we have <coughs> uh, an area that we create during the fair, which we call the Xfinity Arena Stage, and that will seat up to about 6,300 people. Mm -hmm. We also have on the fairgrounds uh, uh, our Coliseum building, which is vintage 1916, which will seat uh, similarly about 6,000 people. In addition to that, also during the fair, we have a smaller stage uh, on the grounds we have several smaller stages, uh, one of which will seat is open seating. Uh, it can legitimately fill up with about three or 4,000 people. And then there are two uh, additional smaller locations where you would have hundreds of people uh, in attendance. Okay, anybody else? Uh, these uh, uh, headliner shows, Carrie Underwood, Beyonce, are they only during the fair or are they uh, at times when the fair isn't there? Uh, it, in, in recent times, mainly because of the price of, of, of securing these entertainers uh, has skyrocketed so that it's been just uh, during the fair. But uh, during the history of the Eastern States, we have a year-round history of, of having featured main performers on the property. Okay, thank you. I'm Jim. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, again, I want to bring us uh, back, I think, to what uh, the current statutory and regulatory um, uh, structure here um, requires us to look at and consider when considering an impacted live entertainment uh, venue. Again, going back to some of my uh, previous remarks, really the legislation's focus was on certainly um, uh, protecting almost absolutely uh, venues between, with seats between 1,000 and 35. Uh, hundred and second, the statute um, is really designed to protect existing venues from potential advantages that gaming applicants may have in attracting talent to venues that are part of a casino development. They're the so-called, and these are, I think, the commission's term, supply-side concerns that the MGC again discussed back in uh, the fall of uh, 2012. Uh, the primary example of that being things like uh, radius restrictions. Um, the statutes and regulations, however, are not designed to protect every venue from uh, competition in the market. They're designed to protect from the use or abuse of market power, and the potential to subsidize entertainment offers or put in place restrictions such as the radius restriction or other anti-competitive practices that we just have not heard about today at all. We've heard a great history of the Big E. Uh, we understand it's important to the region. It's actually a vision that we share, and I think Mr. Mathis is gonna speak to um, the, really the unlimited opportunities considering the, the diverse nature of the offerings that um, the Big E, uh, uh, excuse me, that uh, the Eastern States uh, has uh, well beyond uh, live entertainment uh, venues. And I do think we need to stay focused to that. This isn't a statute or the regulations don't protect uh, convention business, they don't protect trade show business. It's really looking at how the market will operate in Massachusetts when it comes to attracting and bringing live entertainment to this particular uh, region. You know, we, we've uh, talked about the factors that uh, really that go into uh, evaluating that, including distance, venue capacity, uh, the type of performances, um, whether or not uh, the applicant is going to propose any radius uh, restrictions, which we have put on the record numerous times and which is part of our application materials before the commission that we are not going to do that. 
Um, certainly, the Commission has really formulated a, a multi-part test for this in those factors, and really went back, I think, in designing its regulations. It didn't come up with essentially a set of boxes that get checked off and you're per se an entertainment venue for the purposes of this regulation. You said you were going to take this up on a case-by-case -case basis, and I think that's important. And certainly, I don't think anybody can be penalized by having a disagreement over whether or not an institution uh, qualifies uh, for that. Um, again, is the eastern states likely to experience a negative impact from the development uh, of the uh, proposed project in Springfield? Essentially, the eastern states has come here today and just declared itself um, an impacted live entertainment venue based on the proximity and the facts that it happens to have two live entertainment venues that it programs with live entertainment. It believes that enhanced competition, um, and I think we've heard words like significantly threatened, uh, biggest challenge in the history of the uh, fair, um, it believes that the enhanced competition from the 12 events that MGM has proposed through local venues such as the Mass Mutual Center, Symphony Hall, and uh, as well as uh, City Stage uh, are uh, essentially the, 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 what I take from the presentation going to be the downfall uh, of the eastern states. Well, let, let me just jump in there because that's not quite what I heard. I heard, and, and Mr. Mathis said that those 12 are a minimum, yep. uh, but what I heard was a concern about being able to outbid, and this is my interpretation of it, being able to outbid the Beyonce's and the Carrie Underwoods and the ability to host the kinds of trade shows that otherwise would be at uh, the Eastern States and a thin margin uh, that allows uh, the Big E to exist and serve the agricultural, regional agricultural community and is supported by these um, the income from these big name acts. That, that's the essence of what I heard. Sure, I understand uh, that's where you're coming from, uh, uh, Chairman, and I don't mean to at all mischaracterize the, right. the argument that's been uh, made here today, but I want to put a fine point on the type of, uh, of what we are offering in Springfield, which is, um, again, uh, not subject to uh, a maximum limitation, but as Mr. Mathis indicated uh, previously to the Commissioner, it's our hope that the minimums that we've provided for these particular uh, forums will help them sort of sustain themselves uh, and go on to compete in the marketplace. And the matter of fact is we are going with established existing venues, venues that have competed in the marketplace with the eastern states um, in the past, and they will continue to do so, um, and have the, uh, in, in connection with the added events um, that uh, MGM is going to offer. Um, I, I am a little bit troubled sort of about the creep in here with uh, trade shows. Uh, I'm not sure how that fits into the live impacted venue um, uh, 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 regulations or the intent behind the legislation. It was really designed in order to uh, protect, I think, theaters that were within a certain uh, seating capacity. So I'd urge the Commission to really stay focused on that part and taking your comments, certainly, um, Commissioner, to, to heart about what is being uh, asked here. Um, I really think it's appropriate to focus on the live entertainment aspects. The Eastern States has, uh, has also suggested, and certainly their experience in comparison to some of the practices in the Connecticut uh, casinos and the driving up of, uh, of potential uh, prices related to that. Um, certainly the biggest one there, um, again, is uh, having to do with blackouts or radius restrictions. And it's really something that MGM has not put on the table, has made abundantly clear uh, to the Commission that we don't intend to engage in that type of a practice. And I do think it's important, too, to take, uh, take stock of sort of, of the of the eastern states uh, as a whole. Again, thinking back to what the regulation, I think, and the statute was intended to protect, the eastern states certainly is a, um, a significant uh, organization, one that's very important certainly to, uh, to the region, um, offers economic benefits that you've uh, certainly heard. Um, but really, I think uh, an organization of that magnitude, um, especially in comparison to what you heard, it's interesting, uh, earlier today regarding a local uh, theater. We sort of have bookends here. 
Is this also the type of venue that the regulation was intended to, uh, to uh, protect based on sort of the other spectrum of being a really major institution attracting 2.5 million visitors uh, per year, uh, owning 175 acres, having multiple buildings and two large entertainment venues. It's a nonprofit, but it's also a big business. Um, certainly as well, and I think that should be taken into consideration. <clears throat> if, if, um, if I may... Uh, excuse me, just one second. Are you finished, uh, uh, No, no, I want to give uh, Mr. Mathis a little bit of uh, uh, time. Again, I think that it really to highlight, of, you know, what our vision is with uh, the Eastern States Exposition. It's a, it truly is a gem in a lot of ways, and certainly the opportunity to leverage its offerings in connection with the development in Springfield is something that um, we've been interested in and certainly have had uh, some uh, discussions uh, about. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Mathis to talk a little bit about um, I, I really will try to be brief about on, on this. I mean, if you look at the <clears throat> if you look at the stats in front of you, when you talk about a behemoth, I think Eastern States falls into that category and Big E falls in that category. Uh, if the if the statute were enlightened enough, they would potentially provide us protection from some of the things that you just heard. Beyonce and all the other acts that they describe, they're competitive. Um, you know, I, I think the danger of these hearings, and, and I've, I've fall, I think we've fallen into it again, I'm going to fall into it again, is to turn them into negotiations. Um, so I think context is important, but I will tell you that despite the comments, and I respect Mr. Uh, Cassidy uh, immensely, we've had a meeting, uh, a face-to-face -face meeting, we've had a phone call, we've exchanged documents. Um, this is a commercial transaction between two powerhouses. And with his permission, I would show you the back and forth we've had on that document, and you'll understand that this is really about leverage and commercial transactions. For example, we mutually agree that it's a good idea to have shuttles go back and forth during the Big E, that 17-day window, between our property and, and the fair. You know, the question's going to be, who pays for it? That's a commercial transaction that should happen between two large commercial companies. I, my, my sense is that they believe that through the designation, they'll get more leverage in that discussion. Um, I don't think that's an appropriate use of this forum. Um, I'll also say that there are many benefits that we discussed in terms of impact. Ultimately, it's about impact. I know they've got a large live entertainment um, program, but the question is, will we adversely impact them? Uh, there's a reference to they, a generic they, and radius restrictions. We will put on the record, um, in fact, this year is a great example. As I understand it, the Big E had this record year this year, a million and a half attendees. Same year that we put Pitbull in the Mass Mutual Center, the same year that we put uh, mm -hmm. professional bull riding in the Mass Mutual Center, the same year that we put Boys to Men in Symphony Hall. So the concept that they can do well uh, and we can do well is not inconsistent. And none of those agreements did we put a radius restriction that prevented any of those acts from going into the Big E. Commit now that we would not put any such restriction. So I think ultimately the question is, have they demonstrated that we will adversely impact them? I don't think they have because that's certainly not our intent. And um, if, if allowed to proceed outside of this context, we'll, I'm confident we'll reach an agreement. Will it be an agreement that they're completely happy with? I can't say that. Will it be an agreement that we're completely happy with? Probably not. But the point is we're, we're large enough uh, organizations that we can reach commercial commercial terms to make sure that we both mutually benefit. We don't we don't ignore the fact that that they have a tremendous uh, opportunity to provide visits to our property, and by the same token, we can provide visitation to their property. Thank you. Um, how many seats are in the Mass Mutual? Do you, does anybody know? Uh, I think it, there's various configurations, but I think it can go up to eight thousand. 8,000? Yeah. Anybody else before we go back? Did you, did you have something else you wanted to say? Well, I, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I just, you know, I wanted to uh, further explain, you know, uh, the Eastern States relies on a cadre of about 1,000 volunteers. You know, when the fair is running, our, our payroll will be about 1,000 people. But we operate the Eastern States Exposition year-round with less than 30 full-time employees. So as much as we're a big business, you know, we have to run uh, a certain way in order for us to survive. 
And we rely uh, through our history on philanthropy and, and in this case, uh, volunteers. So, you know, I, I, I've never heard the Eastern States be described as a big business. During our 17-day fair, we can earn as much as 20, uh, as much as 82% of our revenue in 17 days. 82% of our gross receipts will be raised in 17 days. On the middle weekend of the fair, it's been known to happen that we, you know, we always you know, keep our fingers crossed uh, for the middle weekend because we can earn as much as 26% of our gross operating receipts on just those two days, Saturday and Sunday. We are in a very precarious business. We have a 100-year-old plant, and we do have 175 acres. We have 44 buildings, most of which were built prior to the Second World War. It is a very capital-intensive plant to maintain. We operate on an incredibly thin margin. Uh, j just in closing, a, a couple observations. Um, you know, what I, I guess I hear, I'm hearing MGM say is, and, and the juxtaposition is, is interesting because the Majestic went before us, but the Majestic is far too small, uh, the, the Eastern States Exposition is too large. Where, where, where's, where's the middle? What, what, what meaning does this statutory protection have? Um, and and I, 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 I'm also a little shocked, I guess, by the uh, position that uh, it somehow suggested that Eastern States is using this as, uh, as leverage. Under the statute, the Eastern States does not have an obligation. The reason it's here is because not only did um, MGM ignore it uh, in the early parts of the process, but now it objected. The Eastern States didn't choose to be here. It's entitled to the protection. The reasons why it's entitled to those protections are outlined in detail in the papers it's filed with the commission. And uh, once again, we urge you to focus on those papers and uh, designate the Eastern States Exposition um, uh, impacted live entertainment venue and give it the protections to which it's entitled. Thank you. Anything else? No, thank you. Thank you very much, thank you. folks. Thank you. Uh, we will take a uh, one-hour lunch break. We'll be back at a quarter to two, and we will then pick up with um, Lynn Auditorium, Mohegan Sun, etc.